You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. We also want this training program to give you an opportunity to learn more about sex offenders. I attended the program today so I could take back information for myself as well as fellow officers about the investigating of people charged with sexually based offenses at the federal level. It's also difficult for the victim to see it as a sexual crime. We at the Federal Corrections and Supervision Division feel that this is an important issue to be addressing and that we have made it a priority at the AO. I think this training will teach us to uh, do better pre-sentences, number one, to start the process, and secondly, will help us supervise them by knowing what kind of conditions to impose and knowing more about the offender himself when he's released for supervision. The client is the community, or the community is the uh, client. Um, so I may be treating, we may be treating an offender, an individual, but that individual may not be my primary client. We've always heard about this program at Butner, but now we've actually been here and have had an opportunity to see the staff, meet the staff, see the program. So I think it's going to give us a lot of insight into what goes on back here and how we can continue that in the community. Welcome to the second installment of Special Needs Offenders, FCI Butner Sex Offender Treatment Program. I'm Mark Maggio. Investigation and supervision of sex offenders pose many unique challenges to probation and pretrial services officers. Now, this focused edition of the Special Needs Offenders series features Dr. Andres Hernandez and his staff discussing those challenges with nearly 100 pretrial services and probation officers. Dr. Hernandez is the director of the Sex Offender Treatment Program at the Bureau of Prisons Federal Correctional Institution in Butner, North Carolina. They met over two days in June of 2000 at FCI Butner. Sponsored in part by the Federal Judicial Center, the conference was entitled Effective Management of Sex Offenders in the Community. Now, so much material was covered in those two days that we couldn't squeeze it all into one two-hour broadcast. So, we divided the program into two parts. And this is part two. Today we concentrate on the sex offender specific pre-sentence investigation, risk assessment, and sex offender management. Now, as you may recall, part one featured general discussions of sex offenders and an overview of the treatment program at Butner. And we appreciate your evaluations and comments regarding part one of this program. And Dr. Hernandez put together a wealth of information and supplemental reading materials for the conference. And most of those materials and the complete unedited two-day conference slide presentation can be found on the DCN. Now, one note about the slide handout. Our topic headings in the video match the topic title slides in the handout. And we provided the handout for the entire two-day conference rather than a short edited version. However, since this video program is an edited version of the two-day conference, the result can be a bit confusing for those who are trying to follow along. Now this problem was pointed out to us following part one and we thank you for that and we'll be sure to keep it in mind for future programs. Now other written materials referred to in this program can be found on the website for the Center for Sex Offender Management. Now, their web address is csom.org. But for now, let's join Dr. Karen Steinauer, staff psychologist in the Sex Offender Treatment Program at FCI Butner, as she talks about a sex offender specific pre-sentence investigation. What I'd like to do is turn our focus to something that's very near and dear to all of our hearts, and that would be the pre-sentence investigation report. Our intention this morning is to share information with you about how you can make the pre-sentence investigation report more offense and offender specific. So I'll start off with uh, the certain general comments, general suggestions. Whenever possible, please describe victim characteristics. Even if on the images, we talk a lot in our um, agency about the uh, child pornographer, a fairly new type of offender relative to other types of offenders. And one of the things that we hear, as we mentioned yesterday so often, is that uh, the child pornographer is not necessarily seen as a sex offender. 
Well, in fact, he is, and there are a lot of things that we need to know about him. So whenever possible, try to find out what you can about the images that the child pornographer is retrieving and how they're collected, what methods of access to the victims. For example, uh, did the person uh, have a number of different jobs or volunteer opportunities in which that offender gained access uh, to children? Uh, did the person access pornography through the computer? Any prior access to victims? Any, any past experiences where one is working in a middle school, for example, or coaching a boys' basketball team? Any prior um, information about opportunities they made available to themselves so that they could gain access to victims that might not be an, an automatic part of an instant offense, but nonetheless very important to gathering full information about that offender. Methods for avoiding detection. Any aliases used? Did the person lead a nomadic lifestyle? What about rental of storage places? Private P.O. box. No pun intended. Threats to the child, verbatim if possible. And any uh, travel abroad uh, to protect against prosecution. Describe associations with other sex offenders. And that, uh, when we're talking about that, we're really talking about the extent of the association and the type of the association. Uh, we have an individual we're working with right now who actually had befriended one of the inmates that we worked with previously who was just released. Uh, what we learned about that situation is that they had had an awful lot of contact over the internet for a period of a couple of years actually. And during the course of that time, they got to know each other pretty well and actually traveled to meet each other. Um, the one person invited the other to come uh, go to um, a park festival with his family. He happened to have a two-year-old child that he wanted to introduce the other offender to. So the extent of association with other sex offenders can be really important to us uh, when we're trying to figure out what we need to do with that given individual in treatment. And one other general suggestion, uh, sexual history. How did he learn about sex? At what point did he begin to have deviant fantasies? What was the content or the themes of the fantasies? At what point did he begin to masturbate to these fantasies? What was the intensity of the focus on the pornography, on the victims, on the uh, chat rooms? What was the duration of abusive behavior within a given incident and over what period of time? Yes. How do you propose that we get um, this information on specifically the uh, sexual history uh, information in light of defense attorneys maybe saying, telling their clients that not to answer those kinds of questions? We recognize that there are significant obstacles to your getting this information. We also experience some of those obstacles as well. I mean, obviously, we're not looking at a situation in which someone is facing the sentence, but we are telling them up front that any information they give us is going to go to the probation officer, to the therapist, and to anyone else in the community who is in a need-to-know status. Uh, you're not going to be able to get all of this information in most cases, and we recognize that. What we're trying to... Um, emphasize today are the kinds of things that would be helpful to have if you could get them. What I've found has been somewhat helpful in my work with uh, inmates in terms of trying to get information uh, is to really zero in on what they're telling me about their desire to change. And by using that, I'm saying, well, it doesn't sound like you've really given us all the information here. And I really want to believe that you want to change, but you know, if this doesn't match with this, then you know, I'm, I'm really concerned that maybe you're not being fully honest with me, that sort of thing, to encourage them to basically carry through in the way they've told you they will. 
Now, in an investigation, they're looking at time, and we know that. They know that. Their defense attorney knows that. We're trying to work also at the other end with the defense attorneys. We get a lot of calls, actually, from them who have concerns about the individuals they're representing in court. Um, and, and they want to make sure that given that they really think this person does need to go to prison, they want to make sure that they're going to be okay in prison, that sort of thing. So we really do try to work at that end as well to educate the defense attorneys to um, be aware of what it is they're actually doing in defending these individuals, that sometimes the, uh, the time is actually a, a great help to the defendant. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's a matter of, of art and skill and trying to get the individual to fess up to the notion that he wants to do the right thing. Uh, sometimes looking, I think from an investigation and looking at uh, sort of the guilt and looking at the fact that he's facing a family who's just been uh, somewhat uh, influenced by uh, what he's done and, you know, the, the idea of coming clean. I don't know if you'd like to add to that, Andres. Yeah, I, I want to uh, underscore what uh, Karen is saying. I, we, we recognize that uh, a lot of this information you, you simply will not ha have access to. However, I've seen uh, PSI reports in which uh, the offenders uh, do disclose and do talk to you and actually talk to you in a way that uh, is uh, very detailed. I've seen uh, pre-sentence uh, uh, reports that are extremely detailed and I can't tell you how helpful that is to us. It takes multiple, multiple interviews and a very uh, good and trained uh, clinician to obtain all that information. However, what we aim to do by giving you this information is simply to sensitize you to the various aspects of, a, of taking a sexual history so that you can, if you hear some of these things, that they will resonate and you may ask an additional question. Yes. A lot of times, but as the lady indicated, the uh, attorney will not, elect, not allow us to put the detailed information in there. But what I'm saying is that we may make a reference as to this person was seen at the treatment program in 99. And will you guys use that as a flag for when you're questioning the offender as to well, what happened in 99 at this program? And hopefully you can withdraw the information from the offender that we couldn't get in the PSI exactly. Certainly, we do use that kind of information. That's very helpful to us. Can you actually send for or retrieve the information, or do you have to get it from the offender? No, we can actually send for that information. We, we have anything that we, we uh, understand to be out there having to do with this person's history that we think would be relevant in a treatment program, we can ask for that information, whether it's uh, with one of the federal agencies or with a uh, private therapist, that sort of thing. And in fact, when we get inmates into the program, one of the things we do is let them know that we're going to be doing that. We, we get them to retrieve addresses and all that other type of legwork for us. Uh, they know up front that we're going to be doing this, that we're going to give them, give information about them over. Moving along to personal history, if you can find out anything about the quality and nature of any significant re relationships they've been involved in, uh, and this should be verified with partners whenever possible. They can give a real um, slanted view of what actually occurred within that relationship, what the quality of that relationship was. Uh, what we found is that uh, they're often invested in having us believe that they've had numerous very successful relationships. And as we probe more, we find that a relationship might have lasted for two weeks, but it was really significant. Uh, so any information you can find out about the quality and nature of relationships and, and verifying that with partners whenever possible uh, would be helpful. Occupational history. This is an interesting one because, uh, excuse me, yeah, question? How do we get that information to you? Because I had a situation where the attorney objected to um, me putting in that he still had contact with one of the victims and they were involved in a relationship. How would we get that information to you? Once again, we are in, in this uh, presentation presenting to you an optimal level of assessment. The, ideally, this is what uh, ought to be communicated in a pre-sentence report. 
we're simply saying to you, this is what we recommend, this is ideal. If you can put it in that report, somehow convey that information to us, uh, that, that is just ideal. But we recognize that you may be limited in providing uh, us with that information and particularly in putting that information, uh, putting that information in the uh, pre-sentence report. Did that answer your question? One more thing. Do you go back and contact the PO? Have you guys ever thought about that? Do we uh, go back and contact the, the PO? Uh, the, the writer of the uh, pre-sentence report? Yes. Sometimes I've done that. Uh, not typically, though. Uh, do you feel that, uh, that that is something that we should routinely do? Yeah, I think so. I yeah, would I mean, think it would be helpful, because a lot of times you have to get information that is taken out of the report because of objections. And if, you know, we know, may know more to the story than what's presented in the report. We, we can certainly incorporate that into, into what we do. And, uh, you know, we'll give it serious consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Regarding occupational history, one of the reasons this is important is because it may highlight for us uh, significant access to the preferred, preferred victim group. Um, it could highlight certain methods of access to victims, such as I was talking about yesterday, the meter reader, the um, heating and air repair person, uh, more unstructured, less easily supervised uh, occupations could call certain things into question. It certainly would help us to uh, focus on that with that offender while he's in treatment to find out more about uh, what he was actually doing with his time while he was on that job. The person that I talked about yesterday, the peeper, uh, he spent an awful lot of time of his day um, you know, going to different houses, uh, gaining access to these houses, collecting information about women, um, all while he was believed to be working because his particular job was a very unstructured, unsupervised type of position. Also include any information regarding grievances that may have been brought against him or any firing or suspicious rec resignations. It may be that a, an employer suspected that this individual was engaged in some kind of inappropriate activity but didn't want to take the risk of actually firing that person for that reason, uh, or, or actually did fire that person for that reason, but we, we will not necessarily know to uh, get at that unless we know that that person was fired or did resign uh, very rapidly. Okay, educational background, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, military history, include here any available travel itineraries. This is important because he may have frequented specific countries that are known among the sex offender community as countries in which access to children is very easy. And it would be helpful for us to know where he was spending his time so that we could zero in on that when we're, we're in treatment with that individual. What are those countries? Uh, we could list a few. There are probably many. Uh, several that come out in our program pretty routinely are Thailand, Germany, Holland, the Philippines, Costa Rica and several other Latin American countries. Okay. If, if the person was discharged from the military, what type of discharge was it? Were there any allegations made against him while he was in the military? Financial history. On the surface it would seem like this would not be all that important. But if you could get information about any spending patterns, uh, availability of funds, uh, or any unexplained significant expenditures, we may be able to find out more information about what that person was spending his money on. It could be travel, it could be to purchase videos, it could be to uh, pay for uh, trips to other locations where he may have offended. Uh, so somehow getting at how that person spent his money and what the availability of funds was could be real helpful to us. Psychiatric history, uh, are there any psychological evaluations available? Was there previous treatment or hospitalizations? If so, when? What was the presenting problem when that person was evaluated or hospitalized? Uh, and and any, any diagnoses that were made? Uh, and what was the type and frequency of contact with mental health professionals? Uh, any information you can give us about specific professionals seen, we will use that information to follow up with that individual. So if we have a name and a general location, 
we do look that person up and try to get any evaluations. We also try to talk to that person directly about that treatment. That sometimes will require on our part uh, that we get a release of uh, information from the inmate. Um, but usually shortly after they're in the program, they know that that's actually something that um, we're going to be doing and they see that as a routine part of the treatment program. So we very rarely will have any problems with getting releases of uh, information from them. I've already mentioned to include collateral and contact information and it goes without saying to verify information as much as possible. Okay, now that we've covered some of the more general suggestions, let's talk about some of the more specific information that would be helpful to have uh, in our work with individuals. Um, let's start with the child pornographers. Starting off, uh, we would ask that you try to get as much information as possible about the number and types of in images. And here we're, we're talking pretty much about the instant offense. Uh, were there 25 images or were there 15,000? Were they kept in files on the hard drive or did they have a whole selection of disks? Uh, this is one of several ways we have to get at the extent of involvement on the part of the offender. Um, how invested was that offender in focusing on those images. Andres had mentioned uh, yesterday that for some of them, uh, this type of information will help us know whether they're actually having a relationship with images, whether they're having a relationship with objects or things. Uh, it really helps us to zero in on what we need to do in a, in a treatment process with them. The, uh, the number and type and content of images also tell us about the uh, arousal patterns of the offender. Um, it is very different to have, say, a group of pictures of uh, children nude, let's say, in a, in, in a nudist uh, camp, versus uh, having an image of a three-year-old child being raped anally with a bottle. Okay, those are very different type of images. Uh, both may be uh, conceived as child pornography, and yet, they do tell us a great deal about the sexual arousal patterns of the offender. Some of the images, uh, the uh, children are, are portrayed as uh, uh, having smiles and having, quote unquote, a good time. Some of the uh, images uh, clearly depict uh, children in, in great psychological distress, crying, bleeding, in restraints. That tells us a great deal about the offender, their sexual arousal pattern, so that there is no question for them to minimize and say, well, I was just looking at pictures. Many people do not uh, appreciate what child pornography is. They, they often think it's, oh, th those are new children. No, that's not it, and, and you, you know that uh, very well. content of the images, it's really important to know the details of what was actually in the images, uh, as well as the method of organization that I had mentioned earlier about uh, how much time they're spending filing, um, sorting through. Uh, there's a lot of focus on getting the entire series of pictures. So you might see three pictures that tell part of a story uh, and the offender is looking for the remaining three pictures that he knows uh, are out there somewhere, so he'll spend a lot of time trying to c essentially complete the set. Uh, that kind of information, like I said, is very helpful to us in, in doing our treatment planning with that individual. One more thing I forgot to mention about the extent of involvement. Uh, did the offender spend three hours a week, or did the offender spend 50 to 60 hours a week looking at images, or spending time on the chat lines talking about sexually explicit activity? Uh, this information will help us, again, to understand how invested he is in his sexually deviant behavior. We had an individual who actually had no contact crimes pass the polygraph in regard to that as well. Um, very highly educated, um, very well employed, uh, in his mid-30s, pretty isolated, pretty um, uncomfortable in social situations. And he started out with just downloading a couple of pictures here and there. and gradually, within a year's period of time, had moved up to work, uh, spending about 50 to 60 hours a week on the computer, in addition to holding down a full-time job. 
travel with intent or luring. This, for this offense group, try to gather information regarding, again, the degree of planning. Did the offender have a suitcase full of children's toys? Uh, were there restraints? How about camera equipment? At what point did the offender begin to work out the details of his trip with the travel agent? How early did he begin working on this trip? That will tell you a lot about how much energy he put into having certain things happen when he actually got to his destination. How focused was he? We've worked with an offender who had numerous chats with an intended victim over the internet prior to traveling across state lines for the purpose of engaging in sexual activity with him. And prior to his departure, uh, he informed the uh, desired target that when he met him, he wanted to make sure he was wearing loose-fitting pants. Now, this little piece of information was included in one of the pre-sentence investigation reports we received. And because of that little piece of information, we were able to confront very strongly this individual who said, no, he was really just trying to make a friend. Um, he hadn't met this person, had talked to him online, found him to be uh, a very friendly, friendly individual, and he was only going there uh, to make a new friend. So the fact that he was asking this new friend to wear loose-fitting pants didn't make sense. And we were able to use that piece of information from the PSI to get him to fess up. Uh, in another situation, uh, we noticed that one of our program participants was spending a lot of time studying Russian. Well, he said he enjoyed languages. He had always wanted to visit Russia. Um, and that, that's all that was about. Additional probing helped us learn that he had intentions of going to Russia to adopt a child so that he could have that child for his for himself so that he could sexually abuse that child and essentially, as he put it, teach that child about sexuality. Well, this same individual had had a lot of contact with another individual we're currently treating in our program. And what we, we came to find out in working with each of them was that their plan, they actually both planned to go to Russia as a way of uh, escaping prosecution. And the prosecution would have been for uh, basically the, the other individual sexually abusing his child, the two of them together getting more and more children to adopt and abuse and teach. Um, and in, in the uh, case of the other individual, he actually had uh, planned to kill his wife. And they had talked about how they were going to do that so that he could have full access to his daughter. Interestingly enough, uh, the same individual had two young sons. And he looked at these young sons as obstacles to his abusing his daughter. He couldn't figure out what he was going to do about his sons. So given that he was willing to kill his wife, who knows what he might have been willing to do with his sons so that he could have ha access to his daughter. Uh, so information about uh, the amount of planning to, to spend time years in advance to learn a language so that you could go to that country to get children it's a lot of planning that goes into that sort of thing. They're really focusing in. For many of these individuals, the, the planning uh, in and of itself is sexually arousing. And uh, that's also very important for us to know. Uh, the spending sometimes months and uh, years planning and fantasizing about how they're going to get there is uh, uh, sexually arousing in and of itself. And that's very important for us as treatment providers to know. Okay, the method of luring. Where did he get the child? Did he contact a child who was pictured in the local newspaper? Did he send sexually explicit images or pornography to the child over a chat line as a way of desensitizing him or her uh, to normalize some of the sexually abusive behaviors that he planned to do when he met this child? Those kinds of details are very helpful. Intent. This refers to what he actually planned to do. Did he plan to find a woman with female children who he could sexually abuse under the cover of stepfather or babysitter? Uh, this information tells us what he is capable of doing. So whether or not he actually followed through, what did he intend to do? Any paraphernalia used, a motel key, for example, cameras, restraints? We had an individual, this actually uh, was another situation in which a PSI was extremely helpful to us. Um, we had an individual who had um, met a young boy in like a 7-Eleven and befriended him and 
uh, got him to bring another friend along. They went out uh, late at night for a drive, cruising. And he had taken a weapon with him, and he, he took them pretty far out and basically very suddenly said they needed to get in the back seat and take the clothes off. Um, and he got back there with them and basically said that they needed to perform oral sex on him. Well, uh, one of the things that he was very resistant about in treatment was his use of coercion. And what we learned from the PSI was that he had a weapon with him. So we asked him, where was that weapon? Well, it was between the two front car seats. Well, how, how much in, in view of it was, you know, was that weapon? How, how, how much did that weapon uh, play a part in his coercing those children? Well, I didn't do anything with that weapon. Well, the weapon was sitting there, and he had already talked about the fact that he had gone shooting with them prior to going out to where he was. Okay, so then uh, the other thing in the PSI that was helpful was that he had said to them, you know, you'll either do this or else. So you combine you'll either do this or else with the fact that he had this weapon, and what does that tell you? There was a ton of coercion involved in that situation, and that PSI information made a huge difference in what we were able to do with this individual. Okay, and finally, travel history. This information could reveal a predatory pattern. Uh, we already mentioned some of the countries that we hear a lot about. Uh, it's also important to know, do they have pen pals in foreign countries? Uh, or did the offender buy land overseas? Uh, we actually have uh, an individual who spent a lot of time learning about Costa Rica because he wanted to buy land there. And further probing of that situation revealed uh, uh, more intention there than he was admitting to. Yes? For offenders that are picked up on one particular case, do you, when you have them in treatment, do you have them admitting to prior uh, traveling that, that they've not been arrested for? When we do a psycho psychosexual history with them, we have a questionnaire that we ask them to fill out, and one of the, the uh, items on that questionnaire uh, is their travel history. So we ask them to tell us where they've traveled and what they were doing there, what was the, the purpose of the travel. So we get a pretty extensive travel history from, from all the individuals in the program. And the, the whole purpose of it, again, is to look at uh, the predatory pattern, if there is one, um, and have them explain what they were doing at that time. Do you find multiples, multiple incidences of them doing this? Yes, we do. More times than not. Okay. Any questions about anything I've talked about so far this morning? Any comments you'd like to add? Yes. Just out of curiosity, do you guys also get the criminal complaint and the affidavit with your packet of information? Uh, the question is, do we get the criminal complaint, the affidavit with our packet of information? If it's a sex offense, like child pornography type of thing, because that also outlines a lot of this information. Sometimes we do, but I would say it's more rare. Um, we, we, we very seldom get that information. There have been, I've been with the program for a little over three years, and I've seen, uh, of the individuals I work with, I've seen that maybe three times. We, we see that information only when uh, it has been provided to us by uh, the uh, government, by the uh, prosecution. Um, but uh, in, in the normal course of the uh, referral process, the, uh, the primary document uh, that we uh, review is the uh, PSI. Now, if, if you can make uh, other documents uh, available to us uh, in, in that uh, process, uh, we, well, certainly we'll be more than happy to to include uh, that, inf uh, to, to look at that information. We, we see uh, different uh, uh, types of PSIs. We see some that are very detailed, that are very offender specific, and we see some that uh, describe, for example, the offense uh, conduct in rather cursory terms. Uh, very short PSIs and uh, in, by contrast, very long and uh, detailed PSIs. I, I don't know what uh, uh, that is a function of. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, certainly the more detail we can provide, the better uh, interventions we can, uh, we can have. Again, uh, information such as describing the offense conduct like the offender telling the, uh, the victim wear loose uh, fitting clothing you know, that is key information for us to zero in and, and really go after what was his intention. Any other comments? I just wanted to add one thing. Um, 
a question was asked earlier when Andres was presenting about contact with the probation officers. And one of the things that I, I wanted to mention about that in regard to the sex offender treatment program is that not only are we sending out discharge packets, but in every case we work with, we're contacting the probation officer prior to that person's release from prison. So we're actually calling up the supervising um, uh, probation officer and asking for the name of the individual who's going to be working with that individual when he gets out. And then we call that person directly and provide information over the phone about what that person may expect to see in this individual when he meets him. Uh, and what some of the overriding concerns are that we have about this individual as he makes that transition to the streets. So there's an awful lot of contact regarding that offender uh, with the probation officer prior to that offender's release from prison. And we feel really good about that. We feel we've learned an awful lot from probation officers in our contact with them. And it's, it's starting to feel like a real um, team effort in managing these cases. So I just wanted to mention that before uh, I turn the mic over to him because it's, it's one of my favorite parts of my job, actually. So anyway, any other questions? Do you guys ever contact the investigating agent? Do we ever contact the investiga investigating like agent? PSI. A lot of times we don't get information in the, you know, during the PSI process because of any sort of a fee agreement or something. So a lot of times investigating agents may be more cooperative after their sentence and may talk to you. I have not. I don't know if you have. We, we have not so. routinely done that. Sometimes when I've gone to court for a sentencing hearing and the FBI agent is there, I find that information just invaluable, uh, but routinely what uh, we haven't done. It, it's some, I'm glad you pointed out because it's something that we could incorporate in, into what we do. Okay, thank you. We'll turn this over to Andres. Okay, folks, in this uh, next uh, segment, we're going to be talking about risk assessment. How many of you, just a show of hand, have been in court where you have seen uh, mental health professionals, so-called experts, uh, argue about uh, the uh, risk of uh, a particular offender? Okay, quite, quite a number of you. This is a hot topic in the field of sex offender treatment. It's been uh, hot uh, because of the emergence of uh, civil commitment. These are sexual, the so-called sexual predator uh, laws that have been either resuscitated in many state uh, jurisdictions or they have been developed. Uh, the uh, Kansas uh, v. Hendricks uh, Supreme Court uh, opinion uh, is certainly one opinion that uh, ratified the uh, legality of these uh, civil commitment uh, uh, proceedings uh, and certainly probably Almost every state uh, in the union now has some type of civil commitment for sex, offender, uh, for sex offenders. Risk assessment, systematic risk assessment, has been under the gun. The, uh, the more traditional way of assessing risk is basically a professional saying, well, I think this person is a low-risk offender, or I think this person is a high-risk offender. Well, the problem with that is, not much reliability in those uh, judgments. So what is uh, risk assessment? Can anyone give me a definition? Come on, we have some experts here. The degree to which that person has propensity to reoffend. Yes. It's a method for categorizing offenders along a continuum. We need to look at risk along a continuum. Now, what we also need to know that it's not a single continuum. It's a multifaceted construct or continuum. So a person can be at risk, the type and severity of behavior, say at risk for committing uh, sexual offense of a child, at risk for committing sexual assault of a child using uh, a weapon or using uh, extreme uh, physical violence. Another uh, facet of uh, risk assessment is the likelihood that the behavior, and this is the most common 
uh, use, the likelihood that the behavior will occur. Now, oftentimes, we don't identify what behavior we mean. Is this person at risk for exposing himself again? If we know that sex offenders commit multiple paraphilias in sex, sexual offen uh, offenses, child molestation, rape, exhibitionism, voyeurism, whatnot, we tend to only identify a global risk. But this is, in actuality, what we should be doing is identifying specific risk for specific behaviors. And we also need to anticipate and try to predict the time frame. Is this person at risk for committing this particular offense with this severity two months after release from prison, two years after release from prison, or 20 years after release from prison? And if so, what are the probabilities that, the, uh, th that that behavior will occur as predicted at two years, at two months, or at 20 years. This is very difficult to do. Very, very difficult. Now some mental health uh, professionals think, well gosh, because it's so difficult, we shouldn't really do it. And psychologists uh, and, and mental health uh, providers should not be in the business of doing risk assessment or risk prediction. Well, I think that we are better prepared to engage in this behavior if done correctly than other persons, other professionals, because of our unique knowledge about the population, unique knowledge about risk prediction, and risk assessment. So when you get a report that says this person is a low risk offender or he's a high risk offender, what does that really mean? Generally it means a global assessment of all of these categories, this multifaceted construct. But I do want you to understand that not only is it a um, a dimensional, a multi-dimensional construct along a continuum or several continuums or continua, I don't know how you say the uh, uh, plural of continuum. Um, so what we really have is a snapshot in time. It's like taking a picture. Click. That's what we have. Risk changes. It changes all the time. It changes every day. If we were to graph how risk changes, it would change because of two different influences, ex the external dimension and the internal dimension. The internal dimension because the person may feel weaker to cope with sexual risk factors. They may, may be vul more vulnerable to act out. The internal dimension refers to the psychological state of mind of the individual and the, the individual's proneness to act out, therefore their risk. The external dimension, again, goes to those factors in the person's environment that make them more vulnerable to reoffend. Proximity to uh, victim groups, uh, substance abuse uh, or um, uh, alcohol and, and, uh, and drugs. In other words, disinhibitors, alcohol and drugs are disinhibitors of a person's uh, control. Sometimes they use anger as, uh, as a form to disinhibit uh, themselves. Does that make sense in, in terms of understanding what risk is? That it's not a static quality. It is really a, a very dynamic uh, construct. It's changing all the time. It changes because the person is uh, on supervision, it changes because the person goes off uh, supervision, it changes because the person is just one month uh, out of uh, prison versus 10 years out of prison. It is constantly changing. Do you, uh, any of you come from districts where risk assessments are used, systematically used to inform sentencing? Th uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I don't, in our district, we don't have that, but one of the things in, in us trying to develop a, policy, a sex offender policy, this issue has come up with this whole risk assessment, and we have 
these various instruments, whether or not we as officers, uh, once a person has come out of the system, not necessarily coming from your program, but once they have been identified uh, as a sex offender, either in history or you know, the instant offense may have been, whether or not the officers are equipped to administer one of these, um, to do one of the sex offender um, risk assessment uh, evaluations and whether or not we should forward that to a professional. That's the controversy that we have within our district. Who should do this and how often should it be done either um, when the person is on supervision or even at the sentencing phase. Um, the officers just don't feel comfortable um, using one of these tools to say this person is quote unquote high risk, low <coughs> risk, or, or whatever. From my perspective, uh, I think it's a question of policy and what policies are developed to do a systematic assessment, risk assessment of sex offenders. With the appropriate training and the policy to back you, you could administer one of these uh, instruments. There is nothing in, in, uh, about these instruments, well some, th there is some, uh, uh, requires more training, but you could administer these uh, instruments. It's a question of policy and whether or not you are going to be uh, trusted and whether your judgment is going to be a reliable one. Uh, How should you do the risk assessment? Every time you have contact with the offender, the conditions that place that individual at a particular risk change, have changed, or may have changed. But you need to constantly reassess that person's risk and match your supervision or whatever other interventions according to that risk. For us in prison, it's very easy. For child molesters and child pornographers, the risk is extremely low. Why? Because there are no children in prison. And hopefully there is no child pornography. However, when they get out, their risk skyrockets. It changes. So when we make a risk prediction, it's about their functioning upon release from prison. Risk assessment is used to determine whether a sex offender may be a candidate for civil commitment. Now, do, do, do all of you know what civil commitment is? This is basically a way of detaining a criminal beyond his uh, release, uh, beyond his uh, punishment or criminal sentence because of dangerous, dangerousness to self, other property. This is, uh, these are uh, proceedings that have been typically used for the severely mentally ill. People who have committed crimes and in, in good conscience we cannot release to the community because these people will harm themselves, harm others, uh, destroy property, and these people need to be in treatment. They suffer from a mental disorder or defect that certainly makes them unable to function in the community by themselves and need to be detained in psychiatric hospitals in other similar facilities for treatment purposes. Okay, how do we assess risk? And there are, I, I can identify, I've heard in, in professional uh, uh, conferences three ways of doing risk assessment. I think we've, we've come up with four ways. Uh, the fourth is our way of doing a risk assessment that I think is a compromise between um, the others. The first is the unstructured clinical judgment. This is Dr. Eminence saying, uh, in my 25 years of experience, I've seen 200 sex offenders and therefore this individual is a low-risk offender or a high-risk offender because I am an experienced uh, uh, clinician and I have tons of experience in the, in, in the field and my clinical judgment ought to be trusted. Now that person's judgment may be very good 
or may not be very good. I've, I've talked to many practitioners with 20, 30 years of experience whose professional judgment is certainly off. Um, <laughs> oh, you've met them too. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so it's the validity of those uh, judgments are unreliable. The factors that many clinicians used may or may not be related to recidivism, that is, reoffense rates. On the other extreme, if you could look at this as a dimensional construct in, in, or process, on the other extreme of the continuum, you have a purely statistical approach. This is the pure actuarial approach. I believe uh, the last count was there were 24, 25 risk assessment instruments. Now there is some overlap in those uh, instruments, but each instrument is different. The MINSOS, the VRAC, the SORAC, the RACER, and I probably misspelled that, you know, one of these, uh, the STATIC-99, the New Jersey Risk Registrant, whatever, uh, that's what that, and ETC, is, that's et cetera, because there are many, that's not a risk assessment instrument. <laughs> There are many. What these uh, instruments uh, claim to do is they take a select group of factors. These are factors such as age of the offender, number of prior convictions, uh, the gender of the victim, etc., that are associated or correlated positively with recidivism. And through a complex statistical procedure, they have developed a formula that classifies offenders at high risk if they have many of these factors, at low risk if they don't have as many of these factors. And this is then validated with outcome data, re-arrest record, uh, new convictions, and whatnot. The value of these uh, risk assessment uh, instruments largely depends on the quality of the experimental design, the outcome data, was the follow-up period two years, three years, or was it 20 years? I'd be more likely to use an instrument that had a 20-year follow-up period rather than an instrument that had only a two-year follow-up period because then I could only predict up to two years. However, this has been, and, and, and nowadays it's now the preferred approach. Now the preferred approach has some limitations because you can only use these instruments only if the instruments were normed on the population that you are working with. Now, in, in the federal system here, we have a, a very unique problem. None of these instruments include child pornographers. None. So how can we then use an instrument that uses factors in a population that doesn't exist in, in, in the norming sample here, in the normative uh, sample? So, but what, what do we do? We, do we just toss them out and say, you know, this is a waste of time for us and we should only use them for contact offenders? Well, no, because they have some value. Now, because of some of these uh, problems, the proponents of these instruments have recommended that clinicians either adjust up or down the level of risk. So, for example, if the, in the RAZOR, a quick and dirty five-factor uh, risk assessment instrument developed by a, a group of Canadians, as well as the Static 99, if you get, okay, high-risk offender, but gosh, you know, based on uh, a ton of clinical evidence, you really feel that this guy is not a high-risk offender because when you know a high-risk offender, he hits you in the face, he overwhelms you. Okay, yeah, but but the, the instrument is saying he's a high-risk offender. Well, but the, the clinician says, 
But this individual has done you know, all this therapeutic work to modify his risk, to uh, gain self-control uh, strategies. How can he still be a high-risk offender? Well, then the, uh, uh, the uh, developers of the instrument then said, well, you know what, we're going to give clinicians the option of adjusting up or down depending on their clinical judgment, depending on what I'll define later as, to, uh, as the dynamic risk factors. Because most of these, uh, if not all, of these uh, clinical instruments only address static factors. These are factors that are related to the criminal's history, the sex offender's history. Things that don't change. You can't undo the crimes you've already committed. They're there, and they will always be scored. So this is one compromise. Now, they tell you that if you, if you score high on one of these instruments, you shouldn't drop the person all the way to a low. They score high because of a, there is a good reason. So there should be some moderate discretion to adjust up or down. The fourth approach, and this is something that in, in our dialogue we've come up with, and that is to use a risk assessment procedure that is guided by empirically supported risk factors in which we use our structured clinical judgment. We anchor our judgment based on these set of factors, not in a rigid statistical formula or equation, but rather using our clinical judgment. The burden here is we have to exercise good judgment. And we cannot let our emotions guide our judgment. And that's why this is often a team approach. Not, a, not one single person is doing this because, hey, I think he's a high-risk offender. Ah, I'm going to say so. No. It ought to be supported by the empirical factors, by the empirical literature that supports this. And, for example, in a recent report that we uh, released, uh, we listed the factors that are most powerful and then the factors that are less powerful. And we talk about the notion of risk as a static one, but also one that can be modified depending on the inmates or the sex offenders application of treatment, response to treatment, anticipation, um, anticipated cooperation with uh, supervised uh, release. So there, there is a, we juggle all of these factors to come up with the most accurate and clinically meaningful risk category. Sir, you had a question. How do you draw the line of this is what three means versus this is what four, number four means? The difference between three and four is that in three, you're using one of these instruments. And then based on the overall score of, uh, on that instrument, then you adjust up or down based on clinical judgment. The fourth year, we're basically using all the instruments because we're using the entire body of literature, empirical knowledge. That's why it's empirically supported. And we anchor our judgment based on what are the most powerful predictors. And that allows us, for example, to account for child pornographers. In many of these instruments, unless you have a conviction or arrest for a sexual crime, they're not, they're not counted. Now, I'm not about to not count a child's pornographer's disclosure to me that he has 94 victims just because it's not on the record. I'm going to count them. And I'm going to assess the level of risk based on those 94, uh, 94 sexual assaults. That's what number four enables me to do. These instruments do uh, limit my judgment, limit what I can score. And, 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 and that is one of the limitations. Again, many proponents of the pure actuarial method, they realize that, hey, there, there are a lot of loopholes here adjusted by clinical judgment, but even when you have all of that, you still have a lot of false negatives. Or false negative, false, well, people you, you're not accounting for, like child pornographers. Yes, ma'am. 
Should we be using any of these instruments or doing anything on our own to inform the judge that this may not necessarily be the most accurate measure of this person's risk? Again, that's a question of policy, and it, it has to do with your uh, particular district. Uh, the, the question is, if, if we get in court a, uh, an expert saying, using the unstructured clinical judgment and basically saying uh, he's a low risk offender uh, because Billy told me that he doesn't have any fantasies about children and he has never really touched uh, any child. Uh, but yeah, he did have 20,000 images uh, of uh, child pornography at home, but he's really a low risk offender. What do you do in that circumstance? Well, I I'm not sure. I think that uh, if th the government should be disputing that. The government should be saying, bringing their own experts and bringing that to court and saying, well, what do you have to say about this? And the government should identify uh, experts who really know what they're uh, talking about. Now, what should you do? What, uh, how should the uh, judge uh, look at that information and evaluate uh, those conclusions? You know, I might, my, my... You know, I mean, the judge is asking us, what do we think of this? Well, I... I, I I, I would say, what I would say is, that's a bunch of baloney, okay? That's unstructured clinical judgment. You know, these are um, irresponsible conclusions. Now, I, I feel with the authority to say that. I've said that in court when I've been invited to sentencing hearings. Um, sometimes my opinions have not been uh, very popular, but I do feel that when there is irresponsibility in our, in our profession, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that. Let me just take another five minutes and talk about some of these risk factors. Static uh, mean they don't change. Uh, you can't undo the number of sex, offenders, uh, sex offenses you've had in the past, and they stay. Most of these instruments are based on static factors, such as number of prior offenses, length of sexual offending history, two years versus 20 years. You know, a 61-year-old pedophile is uh, probably a lot more difficult to treat than, uh, you know, a 22-year-old pedophile. Degree of force and coercion. Some of these instruments talk about uh, uh, whether a weapon uh, uh, or uh, verbal threats uh, were used. The gender of victims. Uh, individuals, uh, child molesters who target male children According to the uh, empirical literature, at our much higher risk that, than those child molesters who target female children. Now this is, may, may seem like a contradiction to many individuals who work in the child sexual abuse field because they see a lot more female victims than they do, uh, than they see uh, male children. However, we're talking about the offenders, and those offenders who target male children, abuse children, molest children at a much higher rate than those child molesters who molest female children. So that's what uh, that indicator uh, is all about. Psychopathy, the traditional notion of psychopathy, not antisocial personality disorder, but psychopathy. Uh, is certainly an indicator for not only sexual offense recidivism, but also violent recidivism and general uh, recidivism. These people are career criminals. They have absolutely no regard for human life. They have absolutely no capacity for empathy. And individuals who meet the traditional diagnosis of psychopathy based on the hair psychopathy checklist are poor candidates for treatment and are considered to be uh, at high risk for reoffense, not just sexual. The age of the offender. Uh, youth has a lot to do with it. Uh, probably it's a function of uh, uh, hormones or uh, I'm not sure why, uh, but uh, young is certainly viewed as uh, higher risk. Some of these instrument, instruments put the age, the cutoff at 25. There are more uh, static factors. Now, some of the dynamic factors, and these are, again, factors that are probably more of an interest to the mental health uh, practitioners because we can change 
these. We can alter these. Deviant sexual interest and arousal. Yes, offenders can reduce the degree to which they are sexually aroused or their response level, and they can reduce their sexual interest in deviant stimuli through the use of covert sensitization, through the use of other aversion therapies. The opportunity to offend. Again, this is another moderator. If the person will go and be residing where he will have unsupervised in close proximity to children, that is a risk factor and the opportunity to offend goes up, so does the risk. Substance abuse, uh, use and abuse, again, as a disinhibitor. Not that substance abuse and not that alcoholism makes a sex offender. I can't tell you how many sex offenders I've, I've said, oh, I only offended because I was drunk or high. Said no, no alcohol makes a sex offender. The alcohol only acts as a disinhibitor. Response to treatment, positive response to treatment, positive response to supervision is certainly a moderator of risk. Psychosocial stability, that refers to uh, employment, uh, their ability to maintain uh, stable employment, the degree of support they will have, uh, even financial support uh, they will have upon release uh, from prison. Uh, this next uh, section segment uh, we'll, we'll talk about, we'll present a model uh, of uh, sex offender management. Again, this is, uh, I want to present the, the next segment with that uh, uh, caveat uh, in mind. This is a model of sex offender management in the community. It is certainly not something that we are recommending that you do in your district because it may not be possible for a variety of reasons. However, if you feel that you can implement some of these uh, uh, elements in your districts and you can get the cooperation of others, uh, those uh, who have the power to implement uh, some of these uh, uh, changes, by all means, and, and, and certainly this is the intent of the uh, session. I'm going to be talking about sex offender management and I'm going to identify four key elements. Now this is not something that I, I came up with. This is not something that um, I, I envisioned uh, all on my own. This is, uh, these are ideas that other people in the field have come up with. Um, I will certainly offer my commentary, my interpretation of uh, the model, uh, but the, uh, this particular model has been stipulated, has been uh, written by the Center for Sex Offender Management. This is an agency that primarily offers uh, support to states and local jurisdictions, parole, probation, corrections, etc. We've had some contact with the, uh, this uh, particular agency, but not extensive. Uh, their focus is really state uh, jurisdictions. They are a federal agency through the uh, Office of Justice uh, uh, programs, and uh, they have very good information. They've had the funding. Um, to do a great deal of really good work. The four elements that we're going to be discussing today are collaboration, the victim-centered approach, sex offender-specific treatment that I think we've already talked about uh, to a great uh, extent, and we're also going to be talking about clear and consistent policies. And again, this refers to what you can implement in your district. This is not something that we're going to be recommending policies that you implement given the resources that you have, given the limitations, given the policy uh, restrictions you have, what can you implement to effect good sex offender management in your district. So let's talk about collaboration. What do we mean by collaboration in this model? This model recognizes that a, a single individual, a single probation officer, a single treatment provider alone can make very little difference. It is the combined effort or efforts of individuals, agencies, systems, and collaborative policies 
that actually produce the intended effect, and that is effective management of sex offenders in the community. It requires the establishment of an interagency community management team. And I'll talk more about what that means. <clears throat> Again, be thinking about how you can implement this in your district, given your vendors, given your administrative support, given your uh, policy support. We're going to be talking about delineation of roles for the members of the team. And also the establishment of expectations and contingencies. This is very, very important because once you assemble the team, once you delineate roles for members of the team, now what? Now what are these people supposed to do and how are they supposed to enforce these conditions or what they set out to do? What is the team comprised of? Or who comprises the uh, team? The probation officer, the polygraph examiner, the treatment provider, and monitors. Now, who are monitors? Can anyone give me an example of a monitor? Significant other. A significant other, yes, absolutely. Any, any example of another monitor? Employer. Employer, Employer yes. A neighbor. A neighbor, absolutely. The police, of course, and others as appropriate. Now, this others, they may not have full participation as monitors, but these people may be, in some districts, they may be victim advocates. What is the role of a victim advocate in this uh, management team? Anyone have any idea? Sometimes uh, team members may lose <coughs> sight of the goal, and the goal is community takes precedence over that individual offender, community safety. And every action of this team ought to be done in the best interest of the community and community safety, public safety. The reason why I do what I do it's not because I love sex offenders and I love to treat them. I actually don't like it. Um, I, I don't like to uh, treat sex offenders. I do it because it's important. I do it because I see myself as an important agent of public safety. That's why I do what I do. All right, so what are the roles of the team members? Well, I think you know what your role is, of course supervision of the offender and coordination of the team. You are the most important element of the team. The treatment provider, of course, provides evaluation, therapy, risk assessment, provides progress reports. The polygraph examiner provides sexual history and maintenance examinations. Does anyone know the difference between a sexual history or a full disclosure and a maintenance examination? Some of you are nodding yes, some of you are nodding no. Sir, uh... Well, you don't want me to answer, do you? Just, just want to do oh, okay. I'll, I'll answer. Okay. Uh, sexual history is just gathering a lot of background, details about the offense, details about other offenses that may not be convictions, and just uh, other risk factors related to the person's behavioral characteristics. The maintenance exams are based on monitoring their progress, monitoring their compliance with supervision, whether they're being fully disclosing and so forth. Absolutely. That's a better answer that I could have uh, given. But to paraphrase for the uh, camera, uh, <laughs> uh, for the benefit of the camera, full disclosure uh, polygraph examination is to understand and get a, an accurate account of the offender's sexual uh, offense history, the number of offenses, the type of offenses, a full account. The maintenance examination is to address the de degree to which the offender is adhering to certain conditions. They may be conditions of supervised release, conditions of treatment, and it, it is usually about a period of time since the last polygraph examination. 
the polygraph examiner will typically say, since the last examination, have you done X, Y, and Z? Have you been unsupervised with a minor child under the age of 18? Yes or no? That is a typical maintenance examination uh, polygraph. Maintenance, maintenance uh, examination will t typically occur anywhere from four to six months. Whereas a, a sexual history uh, examination or, or full disclosure may only happen once. The monitors, they provide behavioral observations. Again, we are delineating roles for team members. This is important that you do establish roles and that you get people to collaborate and agree to these roles and expectations. So let's talk about the expectations. Regular, ongoing, multi-directional communication. This means the team should be communicating on a regular basis. There ought to be communication that is uh, not just one way, not just the treatment provider to the probation officer, or not just the probation officer to the treatment provider. There should be multi-directional communication. Ongoing, regular, formal and informal. Okay, this is one of my pet peeves. Behaviorally anchored progress reports. This is very important. Progress ought to be measured by not how the person is doing in therapy and how compliant they are in session or how pleasant they are in session or whether or not they have insight or not have insight. Progress ought to be measured by specific behaviors that have to do with reduction of risk. Many therapists will offer a progress report that says, simply says, he's doing fine. He's participating and complying with all the phases of treatment. And that's the progress report. He cooperates, he gives good feedback uh, to other people, and he thinks about the feedback that uh, other group members tell him. He's uh, popular in the group. Uh, he's well respected by uh, treatment staff. That tells me nothing about that individual and how that individual is doing. So there have to be, there has to be behaviorally anchored goals. That, that, that should reflect the treatment plan. And the treatment plan ought to be a behaviorally anchored treatment plan. Now I did include a copy of a progress review that we uh, use in the sex offender treatment program. It targets multiple areas of progress in, in therapy. This is one way in which treatment providers can anchor behaviors that are relevant to assessing somebody's progress. A person's uh, ability to have insight, a person's uh, participation in treatment and uh, verbal comments may or may not tell me something about how they're really doing. I'm more interested in whether or not they are practicing relapse prevention techniques or the skills, the learning that they uh, are making. I am more interested in the absence of cognitive distortions. I am more interested in the presence of acceptance of responsibility behaviors. Now those are behaviorally anchored progress reports. We want full participation of each member. We don't want to leave uh, people out because I think that each team member has a lot to contribute. Collaborative problem solving with a coordinator possessing final authority. Coordinator, who's the coordinator? You as the final authority, because you are really the representative of the court. It is your responsibility. The supervision of this individual is ultimately your responsibility. A victim-centered approach. We should be doing things, developing policies, developing procedures and recommendations that are consistent with the interests of the community, children. The community is the client. You've heard me talk about this uh, yesterday. And the overriding principle in sex offender management and policies and in this four-prong model is 
public safety, the protection of the public. The third element in this model is sex offender specific treatment. Now we've talked about what that means. People ought not to dabble in sex offender treatment. They really need to have established programs with the correct infrastructure to actually implement sex offender specific treatments. As we've mentioned uh, in the past, it ought to be long-term and comprehensive. It should be individualized. Now, let's not confuse that with individual therapy. No, it should be individualized. So there shouldn't be a cookie-cutter approach to every offender. Every offender has a different sexual arousal pattern. Every offender has a different sexual offense pattern. And treatments should address that, those uh, individual differences. They should, for the most part, employ cognitive behavioral techniques. There's a recent survey done by the Safer Society. And uh, in the Safer Society, they surveyed a bunch of uh, treatment providers. It was a national survey. And they asked, you know, what type of therapies do you use in sex offender treatment? Now, the, the type of responses that they got were very, very diverse. You don't want to even know what certain treatment providers are, are doing because uh, they're very unorthodox uh, techniques. But for the most part, they found that people were sticking to this approach. Now, the cognitive behavioral, uh, behavioral approach has received a great deal of empirical support. So this is not just uh, a survey of popularity. This works. Adjunct uh, treatments sometimes can be very powerful. Medication treatment, family therapy, couples therapy, can be, uh, substance abuse uh, therapy can have a very profound uh, uh, treatment. I've had uh, sex offenders come into the program and say, you know, Doc, I, I, I just want your individual therapy. You know that group therapy with the other guys? I, I don't want to do that. Uh, just give me the individual therapy, a little bit of that uh, victim empathy, and a little bit of that uh, cognitive restructuring. No, no, that's not the way it works. Uh, we, we sex offender treatment providers, we determine the terms of treatment. They're non-negotiable. We determine what they need. If these people knew what they needed, they wouldn't be in the position that they, they are. Clear and consistent policies. Very, very important. Now, what do we mean? Uh, in what uh, realms? Reduce uh, plea bargaining. In, in, in many uh, jurisdictions, we have uh, reductions of uh, charges from sexual offenses to non-sexual offenses. Plea bargaining from sexual assault to simple assault, from sexual assault to battery, <clears throat> having diversion programs, deferred adjudication. These are all programs, probably with good intentions, that in many ways foster or enable the offender's minimization. A very frequent occurrence, for example, in outpatient community programs where there is deferred adjudication. I, I did work in, a, in an outpatient treatment program in, in the Houston area. And the modal, it appears that the modal sentence was 10 years of deferred adjudication, probation, deferred adjudication. Nobody did any, any, any time. Now, that's not a conviction. Deferred adjudication. So people come in, said, I didn't do it. Prove it. I've, I haven't been convicted. So our hands are tied. We can't do anything about it. <clears throat> and we don't have any leverage. And as we've talked about before, in order to effectively manage sex offenders, we must also have external pressure. And without sexual convictions, there's very little pressure we can exert on these people. Waivers of confidentiality. I responded um, via a, a letter in, in a district uh, I won't mention the uh, district, but it's far away from North Carolina, um, in which there were two mental health uh, 
providers, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, firmly stating that the information that is disclosed to them during evaluation and treatment should not be released to the probation officer. That that information is confidential, should not be released to the probation officer, and release of such information is a significant threat to the therapeutic relationship and the sanctity of that uh, relationship between the doctor and the patient. Waivers of confidentiality in this field are essential. We must be able to communicate freely with one another across disciplines, across agencies. If somehow we all impinge on the effective supervision of that offender, we need to be communicating openly, directly, and with full consent and understanding from the offender that that is what's required. Develop meaningful search and seizure policies. As I've uh, talked to uh, probation officers, there is, uh, there, there is quite, quite a difference uh, across uh, districts between what you can do in one district and what you cannot do in another district. And it's important that if we are to supervise and manage sex offenders effectively in the community, we must hold them accountable and we must be able to as I go into their cell, as I please, and as I deem necessary, and search their cell top to bottom, and I can uh, go to them and say, turn around, I'm going to pat search you, and I can do that, and, and policies do support my actions, effective sex offender management programs ought to have the same power and give you the same discretion to do that. Frequent unannounced field visits, I, I already talked about this, uh, establish non-negotiable treatment contingencies. And one way in which you can do this is by pre-selecting treatment providers as to avoid treatment shopping. Has anyone had an offender who said, you know, Mr. or Ms. so-and-so, you know, my therapist, blah, 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 and complained, can I go to this other person? Uh, I, I, I bet you've had that. I, I encountered many of those individuals in my outpatient practice. People who wanted to treatment shop. When the heat was on, when the spotlight was on them, when they were in the hot chair and all these uh, you know, interesting metaphors, they wanted to uh, jump ship and go to another treatment provider. They should not be allowed uh, to do that. You should determine whether a treatment provider, a service provider, is actually delivering what you need. If he's not, that's a different question, but it should not be at the discretion of the offender. Develop pre-revocation sanctions. Do some of you have pre-revocation uh, pre sanctions? Uh, one, a few. And developing clear and consistent revocation criteria. Now, would you care to uh, discuss some of your pre-revocation uh, sanctions? Yes, sir. If an offender has missed more than two meetings, we remove them from the community and place them in a halfway house. Or if the failures of uh, polygraphs, we may remove them from the community also. So failure to attend uh, treatment, uh, failure on the polygraph examination, may, uh, you may increase uh, your level of control over that uh, offender. Yes, sir. It's important to add, I'm in, I'm in the same district as Jeff, we don't cease treatment. Right. We, will, we will move them to a different, we may start over, a different phase of treatment. And so the offender doesn't win necessarily from the standpoint of being removed from a treatment program. Treatment continues, it's more in a controlled setting. Okay. To repeat what you said, it's uh, the, the, the offender is not removed uh, from treatment, they just perhaps go to an earlier phase of treatment. Um, but they're not removed uh, from treatment. 